thank you to WIDA for organizing this and inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back in WIDA. I think I, I was involved in the very first WIDA research project and, um, back in the mid-1980s. And I've come back um, regularly since then. Um, this presentation is really a, an extended version of my first lecture to my second and third year PhD students at, at Georgetown. And like economists, pretty much economics PhD students pretty much all over the world now, I figured they correctly that they didn't know much about the history of thought, how we've, they come to think or we come to think the things that we think in economics today. Um, I didn't know much more than that, so I started preparing this first lecture, and it took me a month of reading, and, I, and three months later after the lecture, I'm still reading, and it's fascinating. It's like a puzzle, trying to put together a, a puzzle of, of really how we came to think particularly about anti-poverty policy the way we do today, and I don't pretend that I've solved this puzzle. Every, I've did, did done this talk a few times now, and every time I, I, after somebody makes some observation or during the talk, and uh, it helps me. Some, one of my favorite things is to visit colleagues' libraries and find the oldest book I can find there, and uh, I often find some little bit of the puzzle uh, in somebody's library. Um, so I'm still trying to stitch it all together, and any input is, is welcome, but um, I, I hope uh, you'll at least sympathize with the objective. Um, about six weeks ago, no, two months ago, Jim Yong Kim, the uh, president of the World Bank, came to, came to give a lecture at Georgetown in which he said, uh, is there anyone today who would not commit to eliminating poverty? And he's prompting a, no, we all agree to this. Um, maybe we don't, I'm not sure. I think probably he's, he's right that, that most people do agree. But 200 years ago, they didn't. This is a relatively new idea. Um, I'm going to address both of these questions. How do we come to think about eliminating poverty as a legitimate goal? Uh, what types of policy has emerged? Uh, I'm going to focus here much more on the first question. The full paper, which is now clocking 120 pages and still increasing, has about a 40-page section on that second question, but I'm not going to have a lot of time for that. Um, three premises are now widely accepted. Um, poverty is a social good, poverty can be eliminated, and public policies can help do that. Uh, but these premises were not widely held 200 years ago, and there's been a dramatic change in our thinking. If I can summarize that in just four quotes, um, if we start with Philippe Hequette, a prominent um, medical doctor and um, also well known for his charitable work in in, in Paris in the, the mid-18th uh, century. The poor are like the shadows in a painting. They provide the necessary contrast. Uh, a, bit yet, a bit later, Arthur Young, an agriculturalist, economist, uh, statistician um, in England, everyone but an idiot knows that the lower classes must be kept poor or they will never be industrious. Alfred Marshall, a bit over 100 years later, um, and I think everybody here knows who Alfred Marshall is, uh, was, maybe we out, now outgrow the belief that, may we not outgrow the belief that poverty is necessary. And finally, the motto of the World Bank, our dream is a world free of poverty. What I'm going to try and do is document the, the history. How did, what, what explains that transition? What were people thinking uh, behind each of those quotes? And how do we move between the first quote to the last quote? What happened? How did it happen? Um, if I can start with a simple expository model, I, I find this model useful for a lot of purposes in thinking about development generally, um, some version of this model. Uh, we imagine a credit-constrained economy. The credit market is imperfect. Individuals can borrow up to lambda times their wealth. Uh, each person has a strictly concave production function a standard kind of neoclassical production function, a fixed rate of interest. Uh, they have a desired capital stock, K-star, here. Um, let's see if I can... Um, uh, the uh, desired optimal capital stock will equate the marginal product of capital with the interest rate. Um, those with initial wealth less than this critical amount, K-star over a lambda plus one, are credit constrained. 
Um, they would like to invest more. They, they would, uh, um, the marginal product of the capital is greater than the rate of interest. They'd like to drive that marginal product of the capital down, but they can't. We have then uh, now introduced into this model, and, and that version of this model you can find in many papers. Um, there's a very nice paper by uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Institute of Flow in the Journal of Economic Growth, which has a, a version of that model and laid out very succinctly. Let's introduce into that model, standard neoclassical endogenous growth model, of some version of, uh, of many models we've had. Um, let's introduce a threshold capital stock. Let's say there's some minimum level of capital you need to be productive at any, in the future. Now, we can motivate this in many ways. Uh, Partha Descupta is in a, a book many years back now. Um, Partha Descupta outlined a, an argument which would motivate it in terms of the existence of the basal metabolic rate. The fact that you have a minimum level of nutrition needed to, to do anything. So you're sitting in this room, you're probably on average burning about 1,300 calories per person listening to me. Not much more, I expect. Um, to do anything productive, physical, to earn any in income from labour, you're going to have to have an input, calorie input greater than that. You're going to have to burn more than something like an average of 1,300 calories per person. So that 1,300 calories is an example of this came in. There are other examples. We can think about the type of technology, the, the minimum capital requirements in that technology, and, and so on. That means that we have a story of multiple equilibria. We have three possible equilibria in this economy. I've labeled them A, B, and C here. Now, in each one of these equilibria, this is a, a wealth dynamics. This is the description of the wealth dynamics. In each one of these equilibria, people have got a varying income. At, at the equilibrium at A, in the destitution equilibrium, uh, the income is fluctuating. Uh, the income is the consumption equals income because they're not accumulating anything. There's no point accumulating anything that has, produces, it has no marginal product. Nothing, they can't produce anything until they get to came in. Uh, that's a, a classic poverty trap. I'm going to talk about two types of anti poverty policies motivated by that model protection policies and promotion policies. That distinction comes from uh, Jean Dres and Amalthea Sen in their book, Hunger and Public Action. And I'm really elaborating or formalizing that distinction in terms of a, a model of poverty traps. A protection policies are those policies, those short-term palliatives that are needed to try to smooth, help you smooth things out in any one of those equilibria. In other words, it's something that helps you either deal with the income shocks, income fluctuations, or to smooth consumption given the income fluctuations. So that's protection policies. Promotion policies, on the other hand, are things which try to move you between those equilibria, try to get you out of that poverty trap in particular. Going back to this, that poverty trap at A, you have to get a minimum level of capital needed to get out of that poverty trap. Uh, the, the equilibrium at B is unstable. You need to get to the equilibrium at C. This is a, the recursion diagram for every individual. Every individual has their own recursion diagram. So a, a promotion policy is, is something that helps you get from A to C. Anti-poverty policy I'm going to def define as essentially the combination of these two things. I'm going to assert that you need both. Anti-poverty policy is incomplete if it only has one of the two. In political philosophy, the idea of, of uh, the rights-based definition of, of distributive justice has been, is, is now, I think, the, the most common definition you'll find, coming out of John Rawls, Sam Fleischer, others. Um, I'm going to depart from that definition. I'm kind of sympathetic up to a point, but I'm going to put much more economics into the discussion of distributive justice, and I'm not going to use that term, distributive justice, although I recognize there's a, there's a close correspondence. Um, part of the reason for that is that when we talk about it in the development context, we realize that governments, states do do all kinds of things to ascribe legal rights, but often with very little meaning. It's good intentions. Uh, the country I probably worked on the most, India, is full of such good intentions, symbolic interventions that uh, try to claim all kinds of wonderful things, um, but are, 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 are rarely credible. The mystery remains why they persist. So instead, the focus here will be on how policies help do both of these things. And I'm going to basically describe the history of thought on anti-poverty policy as a transition for between two equilibria, if you like, two equilibria of the political economy, one in which only protection policies existed. Protection policies, I'm going to show you, go back a long, long way to at least 300 BC, 
Protection policies are, are, are the e first equilibrium. The second, where we have both protection and promotion policies, that's the, a, a very modern idea. In fact, I don't think we really reached that second political economy equilibrium and the way we think about anti-poverty policy and the way we implement anti-poverty policy until late in the 20th century. It is quite recent. So, the history. I'm going to start with the mercantilists. We can go, go back earlier, but this is an obvious starting point. The mercantilists basically saw one objective for an economy, summarizing things you probably already heard about, which is the, to maximize the country's export surplus, the trade balance. And the, the means of doing that were cheap inputs, cheap raw materials, the, the colonies were crucial from that point of view, and cheap and, and therefore poor labor at home. Now, of course, the balance of trade is zero globally, so this is a zero-sum game. The way, way you envisage economic policy is each country struggling to, to do a bit better, and that would be at the expense of some other country. Would be doing a bit better is defined by the balance of trade. This put a lot of emphasis on the cost of inputs, the, uh, the um, compar effectiveness of, 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 the, of the country to expand its exports. Um, poverty was seen as essential to economic development in that model. The idea was that by, by having lots of poor people, they, you would keep wages low and you would hence uh, expand the balance of trade, make the regime more powerful globally, uh, and that was a good thing. Um, there are a lot of arguments here, and one of the, the phrases that I like the most here is from, from Furness, um, a lot of years later actually, in 1920, the utility of poverty. And the idea here was that poverty was essential to economic development, as uh, Joseph Townsend wrote in 1786, the poor know little of the motives which stimulate the higher ranks to action. Pride, honour and ambition in general is only hunger which can spur and goad them into action. So essentially all we're talking about here is a negatively sloped, uh, sloped labour supply schedule in which the uh, income effect uh, um, is, uh, dominates the substitution effect. And the way that was translated into the writings of the time is very simple. With higher wages, what would happen? People would go off to the pub and spend the money. And here's a picture of an 18th century pub. This is the best picture I could find, pretty much the only credible picture I could find, just to uh, entertain you. Um, uh, in the midst of all this, one of the most influential writers, uh, controversial in his time, not so much for the views that I'm, I'm going to talk about today, was a guy called Bernard de Mandeville. This is a quote from de Mandeville. There's some really wonderful quotes from de Mandeville, but the shores wealth consists in a multitude of laborious poor and great numbers of them should be ignorant as well as poor. So the idea of, of a promotional policy through education was absolutely abhorrent. It didn't make any sense to the mercantilists and people like de Mandeville. I'm going to try and explain why it didn't make much sense to them and why it, it wasn't just a simple uh, awful thing. And, and that would be back to that poverty trap. De Mandeville was saying essentially a little bit of education is going to do no good whatsoever, it's absolutely pointless. Oh, well, that's exactly what would, is predicted by that uh, poverty trap model. If, if the working class, and, and, and in the, the dynamics of this thing, we can easily write down a model where you'll end up with the working class essentially concentrated at point C, they're the poor, um, uh, the, others at point, uh, uh, sorry, point A, not C, others at point C. Um, what will happen then? A small amount of schooling is not going to do much good. You're going to need a large amount of schooling, and that's going to cost an awful lot of money. So really, it's, it's not a big surprise. And in fact, while I was reading, roughly the same time I was reading de Mandeville's seemingly awful views, which maybe are a little bit uh, maybe are explicable, I was reading Catherine Boo's wonderful book, uh, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. And if you haven't read it, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a nonfiction, but describing a, a life in a Mumbai slum the slums that used to exist around Mumbai airport. And um, at one point she describes Sunil, a young scavenger living entirely by scavenging around the airport. Uh, and, and Sunil was a smart guy, roughly 10 years old, nobody was quite sure. And he began understood there are three ways of getting out of poverty. Sunil said this at one point in the book. Um, uh, one, one is um, um, entrepreneurship. Uh, the other is politics or, 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 or corruption. They were one way, not two ways. Uh, and the third was education. He didn't, he didn't see much hope for the first two, but so he thought he'd get a bit of education. So he went to the school that was being run after hours. The main school was, not, was, was empty during uh, working hours. 
um, after hours, there was a school run by a, a, a member of somebody in the slum who, who was doing a, 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 some kind of tertiary degree, uh, and she ran this um, school after hours, and you see this all the time, all over the developing world, particularly in, in India. Um, so Neil started to, to do this schooling for a few days, and, and a lot of rote, rote learning. Um, he'd sat in his English class for, for a few days, mastering the English Twinkle Star song. At first I thought, what is she talking about, the English Twinkle Star song? Not having been schooled in England, I, was, I guess I missed something. So I looked that up. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You probably know this, this song. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, Sunil, after three days of this, all he could do is master the Twinkle um, Star song and decided this isn't for him. He's not going to feed himself this way. Um, he, he did exactly what de Mandeville predicted. He quit schooling. No point. He was in that low equilibrium, that poverty trap. I did a lot more than the Twinkle Star song uh, to get him out of poverty. Protection has a long history, and, and this is not um, maybe fully appreciated, but uh, if you go back into, into history, you find back uh, uh, more than a couple of thousand years even, you find lots of references to protection as an anti-poverty policy. There's nothing particularly new here. It's one of the oldest themes. Um, famously, um, Cotillia, uh, also known as Chanakya, um, was arguably one of the first economists in 300 BC in India, uh, an advisor to royalty, giving advice on all kinds of things. And, and, and prominent in that advice was his instructions to, to the king um, in the time of famine. Uh, institute the building of forts or waterworks with the grant of food or share provisions uh, with the people or entrust the country to another king. Well, that's pretty stern advice to give the, the, the uh, head of state at the time. Uh, India still has a, has a, puts a lot of emphasis on um, uh, protection policies, uh, and, and actually including some of the policies that Cotillia uh, advocated 300 BC. Uh, moving along, the Elizabethan Poor Laws are another example of protection policies, a famous example emerging around uh, in the 16th century in um, Elizabethan times. Uh, a system of locally implemented uh, poor relief, uh, parish-based through state contingent, uh, probably redistributive taxes locally uh, on the property owners. Um, cash transfers paid condition on things like old age, unemployment, widowhood, uh, huge shocks and so on. Now the poor laws were, 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 were the mercantilists were totally cool about the poor laws. They, didn't, they thought that was just fine. It uh, made perfect sense to them. In fact, the, 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 the idea of the state absorbing the role of social protection was, made a lot of sense. Now we're in a post-slave owning society. Uh, when, the slaves, when you're a slave, of course, the slave owner internalizes the, the protection role because it's your, your property. Uh, in a post-slave owning society, uh, feudalism was also collapsed. Uh, we needed, they, the mercantilists understood that you needed something to take over that role of social protection. And the state was the only candidate, and the local state in particular. Um, the poor laws were a very uneven policy in some, some good respects and some, in some, some, mod, some ways models for modern social protection policies, other, other respects including the decentralization. They were problematic, but so a, a mixed record. Okay, that's the background to what I'm gonna call the first poverty enlightenment. This diagram, if you don't recognize it, is a, a picture from uh, the Google Ngram viewer. This is an amazing invention, or just only a, a two years old now, um, where it's possible to read all of the books in Google Library. Essentially what you're doing is searching all of the 10 million books that are digitized now. You're searching them for a word, back to 1600. And then you plot the instance of that word. So here, I've run the Google Engram viewer on the word poverty. Back to, I, I did this back to 1700. Back into the 1600s, very, very noisy. There you were know, very few books published, digitized, remaining or could be digitized, the quality that deteriorated so much. But from 1700, it starts to look a bit sensible from, and, and I think pretty reliable from 1800. Um, huge expansion in the incidence of the word poverty. Here on the vertical axis is the percentage of all words in, in digitized books, all words, the percentage of all words which are the word poverty. No, so it's the incidence of the word poverty in the English language. I'm also going to use 
incidents in the French language later, but for now it's just English. Huge expansion, and I'm going to call that the first poverty enlightenment. I'm not identifying the first poverty enlightenment from the Engram viewer. I'm identifying it from the literature. One of the beauties of the Engram viewer is you click on any one of those years, you can find all the references, all the books. And you can actually look at the context. So you don't have to, I, I, I don't pretend to have a super fast reading speed, so I, I, I'm not distilling all of this wisdom from a vast amount of reading, a lot of reading. Um, but the wonder, the beauty of the Google Engram viewer is I can actually find the, the reference and I can see, for example, is the word poverty, does it have the same meaning as the word has today? And that's an important uh, issue. The linguistics of this and the, and the construction of words and their meaning is absolutely critical. I have another paper just on how to interpret Google Engram viewers I'm not going to go into that. Um, okay, changing popular attitudes around the latter part of the 18th century, and this was really a dramatic change. Um, lots of things happening in popular res resistance, in the coffee houses of London and Paris, so the, um, uh, lots of things going on. The London Corresponding Society is a famous example. Here's a picture of, the, of a meeting of the London Corresponding Society. Um, there, there weren't actually sitting and talking about overthrowing the state. They were in France at the same time, but in, in London they were more talking about radical ideas like suffrage, the vote. And that was a big thing. You realise that suffrage, the, the, the struggle for suffrage, took 50, 70 years uh, of struggle, these kinds of meetings and uh, the London Corresponding Society and, and others. In literature, uh, dramatic changes happening. It's just an explosion of criticism, of people just questioning hierarchies in this 20-year period. There's a, a series of books, uh, a, a classic series written in the, in the 1930s, the Hist History of Europe. There's a, a tw 12, 12 volumes, I think, in this History of Europe, um, some volumes covering like three, 400 years. The volume that covers this period covers 20 years. It's one of the thickest volumes. That's just a, a kind of measure of the intensity of, what, of that period in thought. And it wasn't just the French Revolution, but a whole lot of things happening. And in literature, examples like The Marriage of Figaro, uh, a play in the 1780s that was initially banned by Louis XVI, and um, we know what happened to him. Uh, and it was a radical, all kinds of radical ideas. And, and, and the famous uh, speech in the fifth act of, of, of the marriage of Figaro, where the, the servant is questioning the authority of, 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 of the, the master. In this case, he was questioning the master's authority to implement a very old idea that still existed then, and actually still exists in some developing countries now. It's unusual, but it's still there, whereby the, the lord or the master had the right to sleep with the bride on the first night. The master was claiming this right over Figaro, saying, I get your bride on the first night. And this all, a totally objectionable idea um, motivated the, the, the play. At one point in the play, Figaro says, what have you done to deserve such advantages? Put yourself to the trouble of being born? Nothing more, for the rest a very ordinary man. Adam Smith comes along, and Adam Smith is an amazing character. I think, uh, like... Um, as Amartya Sen and, and um, Emma Rothschild also argue, I really think Smith has had a raw deal. I mean, the guy was one of the most progressive thinkers of his age, and progressive even by modern standards. Um, Smith was lambasting the mercantilists, and the, really I, the idea of the wealth of nations was essentially a, a, a bores down to a, a critique of mercantilism, and most importantly, rejecting that idea that the balance of trade could be the metric of social progress. We needed a broader conception of welfare uh, that covered command over all goods. Um, promotional anti-poverty policies, the very log the logic of promotional anti-poverty policies, really is found in Smith, and arguably um, many, many respects emerged out of Adam Smith's writings. Not just the wealth of nations, his writings on moral philosophy were equally important. Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was important here, partly because of a, a book, The Dis Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. Um, it, was just a, it took a, a Hobbesian-type social contract view of, 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 of thinking about uh, what, the for, what a just society would look like, but argued, unlike Hobbes, that in the natural state people would have some degree of empathy the natural state being take away. The idea of the social contract was that uh, this type of thinking was that imagine the situation of, uh, without the extreme counterfactual. Imagine doing an evaluation of all social organization. Imagine taking away all of that social organization, 
That's the counterfactual, and that's called the natural state in, 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 in this, this uh, tradition in, moral philo in, in philosophy. Um, and, Hob and Rousseau argued there would be a degree, there was a natural, a natural empathy in human beings, something that's, of course, echoed from, from research on mirror neurons and all kinds of exotic things coming out of neuroscience, but also um, and biology and behavioral work in modern times. Um, so uh, basically the, 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 the idea, the institutions of the society were, were things that could create inequality. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was in, was the natural state of human beings. It was something we created. Institutions emerged. The very idea of poverty then was not inevitable. That, that's, that, that, that's, some, that's the beginning of it, just an amazingly radical idea. Um, inequality was really um, important here and, and, and here I've given you a plot in, in French. This was important in, in, in French. Uh, and the uh, poverty and inégalité, uh, the red line inequality is, is just showing the, the dramatic increases in the, in the mid to latter part of the 18th century. Um, and, and here's uh, poverty in French. Uh, in English, however, sorry, no sign of it. Very much the attention to inequality was very much coming out of writings in the French language, not so much in the English language. In the English language, it was much more dominated by the idea of poverty. Immanuel Kant, um, along with Rousseau, maybe even more important than Rousseau, for, for another radical idea that um, people had a moral value. We should judge societies by, by the welfare of people. Where did that idea come from? Well, a germ of it in Kant in the foundations of the, of the metaphysics of morals. The very idea that, that emotional identification, the very idea that, 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 that people could, should not be treated as, 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 as means, that they were ends in themselves. Um, and, and, and that was hugely important, that all people had moral value, had moral worth. Um, again, important. The idea of charity. This is something I had no idea about till I started writing this paper. Um, you know, charity has been around forever, of course, and, 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 and many people thought of, of helping the poor as only being about charity. And that was the, the, the popular view, and some people hold that view today. Um, philosophy and theology had always applauded charity. Uh, Kant uh, really questioned that. He said, is that a respectful relationship between the rich person and the poor person? Can't we have a more respectful relationship, one in which, he, as he saw it, rich people were giving to poor people for the value they got out of being the donor, the, the, the power that they had, the prestige they had, and so on. Um, Kant was arguing, couldn't we find a more respectful relationship? How are you going to get that respectful relationship? You're going to have to have the state take over the role of charity. And that was the beginning of the, I, I would argue, the germ of the idea, at least an important germ of the idea, that the state had a role in redistribution. Um, in all of this, the liberty, equality, fraternity were, were key ideas. The motto of the French Revolution, and some hundred years later, the motto of, of France. Um, interesting, liberty is, is really what we understand as liberty today. Equality is, was really a quality of opportunity. It's, it's, it's curious today we're seeing a, re, a resurfacing of equality of opportunity, and we talked about it last night at the at the wider lecture, but we're seeing a resurfacing of the idea of equality of opportunity. And uh, equality of results has been, I guess, the main thing we think about in the way we characterize and inequ measure inequality uh, historically. But actually, the origins are the other way around. Equality of opportunity was the, was the prior in historically to the idea of equality of results. Equality of results was an incredibly radical idea. This was just unimaginable. In fact, the guy who's, who's often credited with uh, inventing that was a, a fellow called Gracious Babouf, um, a, re a revolutionary, um, tried to start a second re re French revolution around the radical ideas like progressive income taxation, one, one man, one vote. Uh, in his efforts to mobilize the second French revolution around that idea, he was uh, executed in 1797. So, uh, not uh, equality of results was a little bit too early for for people then. Um, a progressive market economy. Where did this idea come from? Where did we 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 get the idea that a market economy could actually help against poverty? That took a long time to develop. In fact, through most of the 19th century, it was just accepted that that market economies, capitalism, was not going to be good for poverty reduction. It was it was good for other things. 
but not poverty reduction. Um, in fact, people were very pessimistic about the idea of uh, um, uh, labour augmenting economic growth and so on. The, the classical economists did believe that, that, I, I, that the marginal product of labour would shift with, with um, uh, technical progress, that, that, that growth would be labour augmenting. But they, they didn't think that it would ever increase real wages. The argument being that uh, in due course, population would increase. Again, it was back to this idea that behaviour of, of poor people was the cause of their poverty. If you gave them extra wages, they'd go to the, uh, the ale house and they'd reproduce more. The population would shift the supply curve back and we wouldn't see any, any net increase in the wage rate and we wouldn't see poverty falling. The Marxists, the uh, Marxism emerging uh, in the mid, the, the strongest, intellectually strongest form of socialist thought emerging in the mid 19th century, came to exactly the same conclusion for a very different reason. In Marx, it was the, uh, the reserve army of the unemployed would keep wages low. But from both points of view, classical and Marxist economic thinking, uh, there was just no hope for poverty reduction through an expanding market economy. The only hope was moral restraint by poor people, but nobody was really making the connection to social policy there. Uh, what would be the role? And people like um, John Stuart Mill were, were, were supportive of education, but not by the state. They understood, I think, that the role of, there was a role for education in, 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 in essentially preventing that supply curve shifting back, which would mean that, that the technical progress could uh, increase real wages. Um, but it didn't happen. It was the, they were very pessimistic about it. Um, in fact, the, this is an interesting um, window in the, on, on the, um, a lot of current debates too, and, and the debate between um, Gregory Clark and, and Robert Allen on uh, the, the, the so-called revisionist view and the, and the lagged view on, on, on whether the Industrial Revolution reduced poverty, essentially. How long did it take the Industrial Revolution to increase real wage rates? And of course, remember, the poor are essentially the working class here, the connection from the real wage rate to poverty was just very strong. Um, how long would it take? In fact, it, it really comes down to a debate over whether real wages took uh, 20 years or, or, or 40 years to adjust to the technical progress coming out of the Industrial Revolution. But they did adjust. In fact, the pessimists, both the classical and Marxist, if they had data, you know, they'd looked at whatever data they, they had more closely, I think they would have seen the, the beginnings of how that, that technical progress was, was going to eventually reduce poverty. The question is why it took so long. We now, I think, the benef benefit of hindsight and, and important economic historians like Gallen and Clark, what we really learned is that the Industrial Revolution did reduce poverty. It just took a long time. Today, with the lags are much, much lower. But why they were so long, why it took so long, is, is an interesting question. There are different arguments. There's a Lewis model you could think about. I don't find that terribly plausible because it's hard, for example, for me to think of England as fitting the assumptions of the Lewis model. But maybe you could make that argument, England around that time. Um, there are also arguments about um, the, the workers were too poor to save, so the only way that you could get capital accumulation is by, rising, by assuring that most of those profits were turned back into uh, investment. Um, uh, other arguments too, I think the importance of uh, financial institutions was key here, um, the mobilising of savings, because you know, you think about that other, that argument about um, mobilising capital, which is, is actually from Robert Allen, you think about that argument, it's really um, not terribly convincing, because in fact you don't, you would need poor people to save absolutely nothing, well the working class would, could say, would have to save zero, and that's not believable. Then the issue is how do you mobilise those small amounts of savings? So really the financial sector development, and lack of a development, doesn't exist the financial sector pretty much for, for most people in their lives, um, that's the, that becomes the issue. Another very important factor that I don't think has had much attention is that what was happening to food prices. What happened to technology there? The invention of, of the refrigerator in the latter part of the 19th century. Transport. Suddenly we saw food prices falling dramatically in Western Europe just out of technical innovation. 
Okay, controversial forms to the poor laws. This is a, a, a bit of the history that needs a, just a, a little bit of attention because it so reflects and mirrors things we debate now. And these are the debates over the poor laws in around 1830, really the first part of the, of the 19th century, and, and in England, because the poor laws were in England. Um, the, the history a little bit was, was the, as I see it, um, the, the English elites were very worried about the French Revolution spilling over the Channel very worried, as you can imagine. And what with the London Corresponding Society, they weren't sure what they were talking about, but it was very worrying too. Um, there was a lot of concern. So it took a while for the resistance to anti-poverty policy from the, from the landholding classes, who were essentially financing the, the poor laws, it took quite a while for, 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 for this, um, uh, um, re, this um, rejection or this resistance to the poor laws to, to evolve. At the same time, the cost of the poor laws was rising substantially. It was getting to around 2.5% of England's GDP. Uh, now, there's nothing compared to the cost of modern welfare states in Western Europe, uh, but 2.5% but, you know, is 2.5%. I mean, we'd consider that a, a huge anti-poverty policy in a developing country today. Not even in India, with the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, we're talking about 2.5%. There, we're talking about more like 1% of GDP, and that's the big, that's the granddaddy of them all today. So, incentive effects were brought out. I don't believe the arguments about incentive effects, the arguments that the poor laws would discourage work effort and so on. I actually believe now that those arguments were a product of the political economy. <laughs> it's not that people were thinking about incentives as a concern. Uh, the, the, I think. Unfortunately, I've come to think that people like David Ricardo were really using incentive arguments. I mean, you read Ricardo carefully on this, and obviously an amazing guy, but he's really, um, he really what a stretch, and his exaggerations about incentive effects. He had no data. He didn't know anything about the labour supply elasticity, and he had no idea, but making grand exaggerations of these incentive effects. Um, Townsend was important too, but um, Ricardo was, of course, far more important to, to economics. Exaggerations, and there are plenty of quotes in this, the exaggerations were, were extreme. Uh, but the policy response, exactly like we see a universal scheme like the, the poor laws we see today in developing countries, the policy response is targeting. As you might know, this is something I think is, is greatly overplayed uh, as an instrument for anti-poverty policy. Uh, the arguments about targeting in those days took the form of the workhouses. Essentially what we did is, they did is expand the presence of the workhouses. The workhouses had started in Amsterdam in about 1600, uh, but it were very big in, in, in England and London. There were about 85, 90 workhouses. Massive expansion in the role of the workhouses. Essentially you, you criminalised poverty. You insisted that poor people had to be imprisoned, if you like, in these workhouses. They would, they would get their, uh, you, and you'd control their behaviour. They would be paid, they would be fed, uh, but they had very limited freedom. And, and that was essentially the extreme form of a, a workfare scheme, imposing work requirements on welfare participants. A very extreme form. Uh, famously attacked, and almost as soon as the reforms to the, the poor laws started in, in 1834, as I recall, the, the um, resistance came. And famously in, in Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, the opening chapters describe life in the workhouses, and this is the best, cutest picture of an Oliver Twist I could find. But it wasn't just the social commentaries like Charles Dickens. Uh, Benjamin Disraeli, a very famous conservative politician who became Prime Minister of England, was equally critical of this policy. Essentially, they'd taken the targeting argument far too far. Um, and essentially, from a utilitarian perspective, this didn't make any sense, really. You're ignoring the welfare losses of poor people, you're ignoring the stigma, you're ignoring the foregone incomes of workfare participants, the fact that they would be doing something else if they weren't in the workhouses. From the, the economic calculation was, was, was really close to pathetic. And the same is true today when people talk about targeting. You look at the economics of the argument, you'll see lots of hidden costs, you'll see lots of assumptions. Take it, very, be very careful about that. Sometimes targeting helps, sometimes it's really not in the interests of cost-effective poverty reduction. Uh, so ta I've, I've covered that, targeting fetishism. Incentives and redistribution, a continuing discussion and debate. And I've mentioned a bit of that, so I'm, I'm lagging on time, so I'm going to move on. The emergence of promotional policies in the late 19th century. So although this wasn't what I call a poverty enlightenment, the first poverty enlightenment, latter part of the uh, 18th century, second poverty enlightenment we're going to come to, but 
if there's a, there's a long period between the two, but there's a real upturn around the latter part of the 19th century. The emergence of social policies, more progressive social policies, the emergence of compulsory schooling in, in most countries. England was lagging substantially in this, but um, throughout the, the, the rich world, with very few exceptions, I mean, Massachusetts was an early example, but very few exceptions, and Prussia was, was, was big on early schooling, on, on, was early on compulsory schooling, but for most countries we didn't see any sign of this substantially until the latter part of the 19th century. And new thinking on poverty, this, this, I love this quote from Alfred Marshall, the inequalities of wealth and especially the very low earnings of the poorest classes are dwarfing activities as well as curtailing the satisfaction of wants. This is the earliest reference I can find to the idea that, that poverty is not just a, a negative from the point of view of social welfare, <laughs> that you, you, you've got poor people and that's you know, you, you know the sign of your aggregate social welfare function with respect to their welfare. Uh, it was also that it was affecting activity, that poverty was, was costly to economic activity. It was dwarfing activities as well as curtailing the satisfaction of wants. And that's a theme that didn't really come back. It was, it was under the surface, bubbling under the surface for another hundred years. It came back in the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, empirical research on poverty, I think I've, I've talked a lot about the philosophers and so on in this talk, but I think there was a parallel but less, less exposed, less obvious um, lines of research on, on the evidence. And one of the powerful things you realize in looking at this is just how important data on poor people was uh, to the public consciousness, to motivating policy. And you see so many examples of this in, in the literature. Um, many examples before uh, Booth and Roundtree, Charles Booth and Sheba and Roundtree, but, but they were important. Roundtree was the, you know, people know Roundtree's chocolates, is the um, started Roundtree's chocolates in York, England. You're looking blank, you know a New York pep, peppermint patty? They're really good. Anyway, Roundtree, <laughs> okay? Um, and he, he, he's, he was being criticised by, by, by people in the local prayer saying that his, 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 um, his workers were, were all poor. And he said, well, no, they're not. I pay them decently. So he, he decided he'd do a, a survey. And he did do a survey of his workers. He did a very careful, quite elaborate survey and came to the conclusion, yeah, they're really poor. <laughs> and they were. <laughs> Charles Booth was doing something similar in London, but in a much more sci scientific way, very elaborate series of... This was pre-sampling. The one thing that was missing here was sampling. But in terms of the carefulness of the surveys, these were really pretty exemplary stuff, and setting poverty lines and so on. And that was all around 1890s. Uh, and also, incidentally, Charles Booth, who's credited with inventing the poverty line around 1890, although there's, there's antecedents, of course, but Charles, I'm trying to, I've been trying to figure out what was the value of Charles Booth's poverty line in, in, relative to poverty lines today. And I can, I can believe, you know, you know, it's got to make assumptions, but I can believe it actually it was comparable to poverty lines we find in developing countries today. For example, I don't think Charles Booth's poverty line in London in 1890s was that different to India's poverty line in the 1990s. Um, you can imagine an indifference curve on which both, you'd, a reasonable indifference curve on which you'll find both of these poverty lines. It's not, there's obviously substitution differences and relative price differences <laughs> and so on. But it's believable. This wasn't a radically different, no way, this was, a ra this was not a radically different poverty line. Poverty was being judged in 19th century England the same, a similar way to how poverty is being judged in developing countries today. Uh, schooling, this was emerging uh, over the la in the mid, from about the mid-19th century, debates about schooling, the, the, the capitalists were, the, particularly in the industries dependent on child labour, were hugely resistant and it took decades to get this through. The resistance to, to the idea of compulsory schooling, to, to state schooling in particular, was very, very strong. Uh, and with very few exceptions, it, it, it took a long time. The idea of targeted tuition subsidies. The, everybody realised, I think, there was this economic gradient in schooling. They realised it was poor kids who weren't primarily were not in school. The rich kids were in school. And they understood the economic gradient. But it took a long time to, so, to begin to develop policies that actually acted upon that gradient. What would such a policy be? You'd have to subsidise poor kids being in school to compensate for their foregone income, to compensate for child labour. You've got to remember, this time, kids were go, working class kids were going to work from about the age of seven in the early 19th century. That was quite common. Um, you really had to compensate for that foregone income. 
That's true in developing countries today. And the way you compensate that is through a tuition subsidy or a conditional cash transfer. The conditional cash transfer, the germ of that idea, again, in Adam Smith. The second poverty enlightenment, bang, around 1960. The decades of the 60s and 70s. And I'm pretty convinced there was something really dramatic happened then. Um, but something also not, this, not well understood, and I, I put this together for this paper. I've never done it before, I, basically because it requires heroic assumptions that I could probably not convince most journal editors were believable. I sliced together two, the two longest series, the two, I guess, most respected series on, on incidents of poverty in the world. The Bougignon Morrison series, going back to 1820, uh, using methods that I, I as a microeconomist, uh, I, I, I go pale when I think about what they did. Uh, but, you know, published in the American Economic Review 2002 and, and a very credible effort. What you realize when you go into economic history is you, as you're, if you're a microeconomist, you've got to just leave a lot of those things behind <laughs> when you go into the, into the history because you just can't apply the same standards of, of calculation or inference because the, the data is just not there. Anyway, Bilgin and Morrison did a, a heroic effort in, in their AER 2002 paper. I spliced that together with the, the work of Chen and Ravay, and this is the series from our QGE paper, 2010. I put them all together, and this is the picture you get. Something really amazing happened in about 1950. We went on to an entirely different trajectory. So that top red line there is the trajectory implied by Bilgin and Morrison. This is a, we've got a mixture of Bilgin and Morrison points and Chen and Revalian points post-1950. But look at that. There's no doubt that that's a significant change in trajectory. 1.5 billion people, fewer people. One point, in other words, if the bourguignon morrison trajectory up to 1950 had continued, we would have had an extra 1.5 billion people living below roughly a dollar a day. So something dramatic happened there. Two observations then, a turning point in... 1950, but also just the simple observation that you saw the picture on poverty. Attention to poverty is now higher than ever. And I've taken that picture back to 1600. Right? The incidence of the use of the word poverty in the English language and the French language is now at, at, at its peak. Exactly the time when poverty is the lowest it's ever been. The peak of incidence. And that's not a coincidence. That's not a... I would argue that's part of the story that I'm going to try to conclude this paper with and when, I, when I get there. That the, 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 there's something very important about the movement between what I, those two equilibria, the high poverty equilibria with low attention to poverty and the low poverty equilibria with high attention to poverty. What was happening in America at this time, the rediscovery of poverty in America, and, and really important books. I mean, Michael Harrington's book, which I remember reading... Um, back in uh, early university days, but uh, I reread. It really is quite amazing, uh, The Other America. Uh, but equally important, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's The Affluent Society. I think Harrington's book was really the, the hugely important one. And this was a shock. Harrington just described poverty in America in, in, in beautiful terms. And it, it wasn't, he was drawing on data a bit, but primarily he was being a, a journalist, a good social commentator. He was looking at what he saw in, in, in West Virginia and Louisiana and throughout in, in Harlem it, it was, and describing it. The original print run of this book was 2,500 copies. They clearly didn't think it was going to be what it turned out to be, a huge mass bestseller. Uh, it got such attention. They were, they, they, within 10 years they were clocking 1.3 million copies. Uh, so clearly it was a shock, and it was really an important contribution. Uh, in, on thinking, resurrecting interpersonal comparisons of utility. There's this bubbling thing in economics from about the 18, 18, 1930s, and a paper by, by Lionel Robbins, a paper I think is, has been misread by many people. And, but um, the only history of thought course I ever did was with Lionel Robbins and, at LSE. And, um, but you know, I don't... I think there's a lot of, we could talk about uh, Robbins on this, but the idea, people were basically going around, particularly in the United States, looking for some way of doing, talking about policy without making a personal comparisons utility. And, you know, this is like weird in a sense, because how can we ever talk about distributional policy? 
poverty and inequality without making it a personal capacity and utility. It's like, uh, uh, uh. I mean, what, what, it's just uh, hard to imagine. Anyway, th that was finally kind of swept away, and Arrow's impossibility theorem was certainly part of that, but, but many, many others, including Amartya Sen and, and others. Merle's formulation and the, the benefit of hindsight, I, I really realized what an important contribution that paper was. The 1971 paper by Merlis on optimal taxation. Basically, a rigorous formulation of the incentive constraint on redistribution. We didn't have that. And now, remember the incentives? David Ricardo was talking about how the poor laws would impoverish England. The incentive effects were going to be incredible. Nobody would ever work because of these poor laws. Uh, somebody it took a long time to somebody to formalize this. Now, obviously, Merlis was bringing some some f fairly heavy mathematics into it, but the very idea, the essential ideas, were things that go way, way back in utilitarian thinking. Uh, John Rawls, I think, gets probably the, the credit for the most important single contribution in the second poverty enlightenment, his theory of justice. And, and again, that's something that, that I reread, but I, 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 I recommend to everybody. Um, this was really the first serious effort to articulate a non-utilitarian uh, argument for the role of the state in, in, in distribution. The utilitarian arguments were increasingly, in this time and, 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 and before, were increasingly seen as inadequate. Utilitarianism did not penalise poverty per se. It didn't penalise inequality of utility per se. It penalised inequality of incomes, given diminishing large utility of income, but not inequality of utilities. Uh, now, there were very few efforts to do obvious things like build a utilitarianism with constraints on minimum, of a minimum standard of living. Nobody was really doing that. You had strict utilitarianism and that was it, which was, utilitarianism was the foundation of the Murley's model, for example. Um, so we needed that articulation of, a, of an alternative to utilitarianism, I think, to build anti-poverty policy more effectively. And in this respect, really what John Rawls was doing was giving an interpretation of fraternity. Remember liberty, equality, fraternity in the French Revolution and the motto of France. Rawls was not saying anything fundamentally different on liberty or equality. And those are his, two of his principles of justice, essentially. And it's exactly what was argued in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. He's arguing it may be better and he's arguing it in more philosophical terms. What's really different is his idea of fraternity. And that was the difference principle. The idea that we could accept inequality but only if inequality inequality of outcomes, we could accept inequality but only if it benefited poor people. Inequality was just fine as long as poor people benefited. No other inequalities were acceptable. Explosions of attention, explosion of attention post-1960, this is just a bunch of uh, engram viewers. Uh, I, very quickly, I've got things like uh, the, the mentions of poverty line, mentions of the Gini index, <laughs> Uh, we've got redistribution, we've got um, anti-poverty policy, but they're all telling a very similar picture. Massive attention in that period after 1960. New knowledge on poor people, efforts in the vital registration systems, national sample surveys in India, a host of things happening. There, new analytic tools emerging, uh, general equilibrium models were an important contribution, social accounting matrices, partial equilibrium tools all kinds of ways in which we're linking data uh, to, to policy in, in new and exciting ways. So lots are happening there, and many people here are, are pretty aware of, the, of that. There was a backlash, of course. Critics and, uh, came, various arguments, and I'm not going to talk about those. And well, it's slightly about time. Um, what was happening in, in the developing world? This was the second poverty enlightenment was very much both rich world and poor world. Because what was happening, independence movements, successful independence movements across the uh, developing world from, from Africa through to Asia, uh, successful ranging from, the, from uh, Mao's success in 1947 in, in, in China, independence of India in 1947, through to the independence movements in the 50s and 60s, independence through colonial Africa. An amazing period of optimism for anti-poverty policy in developing countries, but an amazing period of failure. A lot of that optimism was well-intentioned. The policies were not very successful. And it took quite a while. Um, the enthusiasm 
for anti-poverty policy in the post-independence period was not matched by, by good economics, by good arguments about how to do it. And a lot of mistakes were made and frustrated plans, heavy taxation of agriculture, uh, overly ambitious anti-poverty plans, biases against trade, biases against the tradable goods sector, which was the main thing that mattered to poor people, um, all kinds of mistakes being made. Um, successes did emerge. Uh, interestingly, I don't think it's clear to me that those big successes in East Asia uh, were because they got all of those policies right. That's the curious thing here. They were doing, making some of those mistakes, but not all of them. Some crucial differences. And one crucial difference is, is, one crucial difference is the role of redistribution. Most of the, a lot of the countries in East Asia had radical redistributive land reforms. They had public support for human capital accumulation of poor people. A lot of basic policies on the, in the distributional and poverty side, which actually they got right from at a very early stage. The smart pro poor, the smart poor area development plans, support for rural non-farm enterprises. Um, in some cases, like China, um, certainly Vietnam, getting the sequencing right between agriculture and non-farm activities, enormously important. Um, unlike sub-Saharan Africa, where they've neglected agriculture and persistently they've tried to, to run before you can, can walk in, in many of the, much of the subcontinent, and they're still trying to do that. Um, in, in East Asia, they did get the sequencing right. They put a lot of emphasis on agrarian reform, making sure incentives were sound, is support for rural infrastructure and so on. In some places not as much as others and, and with some uneven successes, but the, but the um, and all of that backed by capable states. A rebalancing uh, came in two important dimensions, rural development. McNamara's uh, Nairobi speech, Robert McNamara, president of the World Bank at the time, was, was really important in signalling that, um, that rebalancing towards rural development. Uh, the urban bias arguments, Michael Lipton's arguments, were, I think were, were hugely important and influential. And, and human development, the other rebalancing that occurred the basic needs approach human uh, was important here. Um, a lot of um, you know some excessive uh, institutional product differentiation between uh, some prominent development institutions, which will remain nameless, um, which I think were wasteful, but uh, sort of predictable. But underlying it all, some really sound arguments. Um, Amartya Sen, for example, uh, uh, criticizing. Uh, uh, roles for his arguments about primary goods, arguing that primary goods were in fact human capabilities. There's been a long philosophical debate about uh, opportunities for what? When we talk about equal opportunities, what, are we, what, is it, what is that an opportunity for? Is it resources? Is it welfare? Or is it capabilities? New international commitment, a, a host of efforts there. Um, the Millennium Development Goals, of course, and, and, and most recently, um, the uh, new goal of, of lifting one billion people out of poverty by 2030. And I think that was, that was well-intentioned in many cases, but potentially very important also in motivating action. The final blow to the idea of poverty, I think the idea of the utility of poverty, this came very much late in the, in the story, although it had, um, had some, some roots. All of this, it, it, you see antecedents and they, they, in the literature and they, they get ignored or they bubble up. I mean, uh, everybody knows the general theory, probably, John Maynard Keynes. You probably don't know Chapter 24 of the general theory because it's all about distribution. And in Chapter 24, Keynes just uh, argued there was nonsense to talk about a growth equity trade-off. Now, of course, Keynes is thinking about under, an underemployed economy. And then the story can be reversed very easily because poor people tend to consume more, so the effective demand constraint could be relaxed more by redistribution toward the poor. But still, that was completely contrary to economic thinking at the time. Economic thinking at the time was that, that redistribution away from the poor would be good for economic growth because the poor didn't save very much, and savings was the constraint. It was the rich that saved, and that would finance investment. Um, costs of inequality in different dimensions, including in fully employed economies, started to be understood much better in the 1990s. Borrowing, the importance of borrowing constraints with asymmetric, stemming from asymmetric information. Basically the idea that it, the, who was being locked out of the credit markets because of credit market failure? It was poor people. They couldn't, they couldn't finance their investments. So the more poor people you had, the lower the investment, the lower the rate of growth. Uh, lots of other arguments about um, distortions associated with um, efforts to redistribute in high inequality countries, arguments about inequality and polarization that make reforms more difficult, and so on. Poverty then comes to be seen as instrumentally bad. This, I'd argue, was really the turn of the century. 
Um, the idea that poverty was actually an impediment to economic development. We weren't just interested in reducing poverty from the point of view of uh, um, our judgments, our moral judgments, which are hugely important, absolutely, but we're also interested in reducing poverty from the point of view of sustainability of growth processes going forward and the sustainability of poverty reduction going forward. Inequalities matter in all kinds of ways to impeding both how much growth reduces poverty and how much growth you get. Conclusions then, we've covered, a, I've given you a sketch of, a, of a, a lot of history here, and as I say, it's, a, it's like a, a, a puzzle I'm, I'm still trying to solve, but, um, and I'm happy for any help in solving it. But we've really seen, I would argue, a radical s switch in our models over this 200 years. Model one, poor people uh, don't have the potential to be anything else but poor. Uh, don't worry about promotional anti-poverty policies. That's a crazy idea. Of course, protection, we need that. We don't want uh, our workers to be dropping dead. So that was all very clear. That was model one. Model two, poverty is due to market and governmental failures. Promotional policies that make perfect sense as part of development policy. I'm not saying model two is universal today, but model two is, 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 is stronger now uh, than, than ever and I think is, is, going to, is dominant today. Now, why do we make that transition? How, recognizing that transition, I've, I've tried to give you the history and tried to explain the, the steps and what was happening. It certainly affirms that progressive change is possible, but every one of these steps was the classic two steps forward, one step back. There was backlashes going on, there was reforms. It took, it took just decades to implement even the most basic ingredients of, 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 a, of a set of policies which would help poor people. Um, when did the change occur? How do we move between these two equilibria? The protection only equilibrium of, of model one where, where protection is, is all we need. Um, well, obviously, that in a sense made a lot of it did make sense in a poverty trap model in, the, in a time of, of, of high poverty. When you've got 80 or 90 percent, if you recall those Boogie on Morrison numbers, he was, they're estimating 80 percent of the world's population living below a dollar a day in 1820. You had poverty rates of 50 plus percent by, by modern standards in, in Western Europe. Uh, it's not probably that surprising that the arguments for promotional policies were not, were not being made very tentatively, and had, didn't have a whole lot of credibility. It was going to be heavy lifting, particularly with those non-convexities, particularly with those threshold effects. It was going to require huge heavy lifting. And it's just nobody was there to, to, to do that. Getting to the promotion plus protection equilibrium, once we had poverty down to a certain level, then the promotional policies became much more feasible. Better knowledge helped. The political economy could switch then to favour promotional policies. The problem is getting from the first equilibrium to the second equilibrium. And the real catch-22 here is that poverty itself is part of the reason why you can't get from the first equilibrium to the second equilibrium. And that's the catch-22 here. Uh, poverty impedes overall growth prospects. It limits available resources for, for funding social programs. So it, it becomes self-sustaining. And you can, you can make that argument even without threshold effects too. How did we do it then? I argue in the, in the paper and um, when we bring in the policies and the types of policies, essentially there seem to be three, three things that, that, that stand out. Improved technology. Technical progress has been in the interests of, by and large, in the interests of poverty reduction. Um, improved knowledge, technical progress and political voice. Political voice has played such a role, those struggles labor movement, particularly in, in Western Europe and in England, those struggles for basic things like suffrage, compulsory schooling, with, met huge resistance. And those struggles took decades and decades. But those three things I would point to as, as important, improved knowledge, technical progress, and political voice. I always like to end talks in, in, in a non-English speaking country with um, thank you very much in that country's language, but I haven't persuaded any uh, Finns to help me explain how to say Finnish in Finnish uh, thank you for your attention.